Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Are we on? Give me thumbs up. Give me thumbs up when we're on. Okay. Are we good? Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Good to go. All right. Let's get going. Everyone could see me. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Today is May 8th, 2021. Welcome to today's class. Today, what we are going to learn about are um, issues plaguing police dog training. And the goals for today is to have us understand what issues uh, are in police dog training and also to offer solutions. Now, I know this particular stream is completely out of order from what I was doing in the course. But to tell you the truth, um, because I've been getting so much, um, so much inquiries and I get contacted so much about this subject and it was getting to the point, especially since this is something that I tried to address in the, in the past and it never really cultivated. If I didn't at least attempt to put out this particular class, I don't think I was going to be able to focus on any of the other classes that we were going to to be working on. So I want to get this one out here. I think this is important. It is not an easy one. I started putting together these notes last night and it just, I noticed that it was just a much bigger task than I was expecting. But I believe this is at least a start. And this stream is going to be public. Um, it's a bunch of information here that I hope gets to some of the right people and it can at least open the minds of some people. And it is not meant in any way to make anyone look bad at all. I don't think the issues that we're having with police dogs come down to some sort of bad guy in any way. I think it just, I think it's just basically mass ignorance and it's really no one's fault. The sharing of correct information is just not really there right now. And even though there's been tons of breakthroughs in dog training within past generation, this is a hurdle that I still think needs, you know, that we need to get over that is um, people turn a blind eye for it, uh, a blind eye to this issue. And I always believe that working dogs are one of the most, definitely one of the most abused group of dogs that are out there right now. And it shouldn't be ignored. So this is my attempt to, to do my best. So try to follow along with me. It might be a little bit sloppy, but I promise there's information here. Anyone watching this stream, if this is a subject about helping some of the issues that plague police dogs, now I'm talking specifically mostly about abuse, um, abuse of police dogs. And I don't use that word lightly. Um, abusive training, I classify it as training that will injure the dogs, either physically or psychologically or training that is just misused, overused, used incorrectly, these sort of things. And what's happening is because it's a big problem. These aren't, this is not isolated incidences of poor training with, with working dogs. Um, yeah, it is causing, yeah, it is causing um, injury, 
Injury and sometimes death to dogs, serious injury to the canine handlers, injury to the, the public. A lot of police departments that have canine programs are in danger of losing their programs. Some of them have stopped their programs. And there's, I have not seen any really good solutions for the for the problem. So this is to get the ball rolling. And this is for me to teach you what I know about the subject. So without further ado, um, let's get let's get started here. Um, Mike sing that Saturday song. <laughs> Most the string that I know I was gonna say I was gonna sing the song, but I, I was honestly I was um, I barely got even any sleep um, doing this one. It just took a bit longer. And uh, I want to sing, I want to sing, um, maybe we'll sing at the end if I'm happy, if I, if I can get through this information, I'll be monitoring the pack howl. So if I say something that doesn't make sense and we need clarification, um, let, let me know. So I'm just going to move along here. It's not, I wasn't able to organize this the best way that I wanted to. Um, but I'm going to do, we're going to do my best. This is what I came up with by the time noon hit. So first thing that I wanted to emphasize is that, um, that this is a problem mainly because there are no bad guys. Do this whole presentation, it's gonna be, it's very easy when we see police dogs being treated a different, a certain way or any dog that's treated a certain way to sort of like point fingers at people, especially the handlers of canine dogs. Um, and I want to make sure right from the beginning that I do not believe anywhere in this presentation that there's really any bad guys. I have been there. Um, if anyone has followed any of my story or any other streams, I have been there, right? I know what it's like to not have the information that I need when working with high level, difficult dogs. I am no better than anyone else that I'm presenting inside of this class. Um, what I believe is there needs to be high level knowledge and collaboration to find better solutions. So um, I put I put our good old Bloom's um, um, hierarchy over here because I love it because I, I like I like visual um, um, visuals and this is not an issue that can be fixed by just like um, which I'll demonstrate by just knowing some dog training terminology and understanding what operant conditioning is, or even under, understanding it enough to apply it. This is something that involves creating, um, creating new solutions. It involves creating new solutions because right up, I've, I, the more that I dig into this, not only do police departments don't really have good systems that address this issue, it works its way right up to the highest levels of government and even military, where you would expect them to have the highest level of technology out there and information. It's it's just not really out there. And we're gonna we're going to to say. Um, I'm gonna do this foundation style, of course. So everything that I present, I like to follow um, my own hierarchy, which is to try to dress this from an ethical point of view. And then of course, understand the issues with the dog. We wanna understand the ethology of the dog and then work our way up over here um, to, you know, to certain areas to see where the issue is. I, I put some notes even behind me over here. I really found like a really simple, uh, simple hierarchy for this issue is, um, is I just made a simple one. I think it's an issue mostly of not understanding the dog, the ethology, and then having the right attitude. Um, a lot of these dogs are getting abused because the attitude of the, of the, the trainers, um, and the animal handlers is, is not right. And it's not their fault. It's the way that they're taught. We can go, we have a whole social psychology stream, right? We have a whole attitude stream that we can watch. It's not really their fault. Often these handlers think the dogs are disobeying for the wrong reasons. And therefore an attitude, if they have an attitude that these dogs are just being jerks and they're challenging them and all this stuff, attitude leads to behavior, right? So, so if they believe this, 
it's very easy for them to now get on top of the dog and start punching the dog or hanging the dog or kicking the dog and to treat it a certain way. So the attitude, we only get a good attitude about training a police dog if we understand why the police dog is, is doing something. If we know that the dog is really just doing what it was uh, selectively bred to do and even then encouraged to do and then it also it often gets conflicted information and we start looking at it as a confused animal and not like a jerk or something that's going to lead to our behavior that's going to lead to our behavior um which which um which then you know we have our pathology attitude so we want to understand the dog. We want to understand the dog. We want to have the right attitude, which leads to our right behavior of forming the right plan. So the right plan, I put ABA over here, something that's really missing um, on the government level. And I'm going to explain why too. It's much too simplis simplistic what they're basing their, their standards on. Now remember, ABA, we have an ABA stream that that we can watch it's a prerequisite to this stream aba is 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 having is is a lot of things right aba is being able to to map things out things be transparent look at it a certain way makes sense we know we need to have training plans that people cannot mess up that you can write it out there's little standards um, a lot of easy things in the right order this is something that's been happening even in the in the dog training industry and even once upon a time on a government level right way back when you had um when you had the when you had Bob Bailey, right, work doing things with uh, with the military and like all this crazy stuff, right? Like with the crows that were carrying cameras and being used for the CIA and and taking photos. Like there were mapped out plans on how to do these things um, with the dolphins and everything like that. This is not something that's foreign, um, but it's something that we're kind of going backwards and we're forgetting about these things. And it's out there. It it does there does exist the ability and the technology to make plans that avoid the common pitfalls that are that are out there. And then of course the hands-on, the mechanics of the the mechanics of the training. That's why I have training right at the top. So this is very simple way to troubleshoot it in order, right? We need to understand the pathology first. If we don't understand why the animal is, is, is acting the way that it does, we cannot create the right attitude for the for the dog to give it the right training plan. And it's, it's we're not gonna alter our behavior in the right way. And then we need an approach that makes sense on paper. This is, when we're talking about government and police, like we're talking about like thousands of dogs, all right? That are just all being trained differently and off, off the cuff. Um, we need things that make sense, can be evaluated, can be tweaked, and are working. And it's 100% possible. It's 100% doable. In order for it to fall into the context of ABA, remember, it has to be doable. It has to be empowering. It has to get results. Um, and so, so this stuff is all completely 100% doable you know then the training of course is the mechanics is how are we handling this dog in a way that does not require as part of our standard tool set um fighting with the dog which is actually it's actually in the training protocols of many of these departments and even in the military so let's go down over here i'm, I'm going to tell I have, um, to me, I'm especially passionate about this subject because it has directly affected me, uh, you know, in, in a lot of ways. Remember, I have, I have been working part of part during my career. I have done everything from preparing dogs for the Department of Defense for a vendor. I have ran a donation program where I was, um, um training and prepping dogs for donation for police departments. And I've been doing lots of work in dogs, security dogs, personal protection dogs. Um, and my experience with um, police departments in, in particular has been crazy. Like my mind was blown through the years at the incompetence. That's, that's really the only way that I can say it. And I don't mean that. And when I say incompetent, I, I'm, they just they just don't know. But I've met a lot of everyone I met that was a canine handler. 
these were good people. These were good people that were often looking and they were open to find um, other methods. They didn't want to be beating up their animal. They didn't want to do these things. And the ones that were more closed-minded, it was explainable why they were doing it. You know, once someone has been doing things a certain way, you got to research your, I mean, I said, I don't want this to turn into a social psychology lesson, but there's things like, like cognitive dissonance, you know, there's confirmation bias. There's, there's these, th there's the foot in the door policy. There's, um, uh, um, th 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 theory. There's, there's all these reasons why people do the things that they do and the way they act to make themselves feel better about themselves for something they would not have done initially if they had the right information. Um, I'm going to tell some of my stories because these are, these are true stories. Um, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to give visuals. So you see, sometimes when we see things, uh, I'm not going to play all these videos, but over here, this was a dog that was, this was a rescue dog that was given to me by a rescue. And they had trouble because it had such a strong work and drive, um, keeping it in a home that they actually paid me to train it so I can um, donate it to a police department. And the dog had the temperament for, for, for the work. And that's what I did, right? This is going back, I don't know how many, how many years ago. And at this point I was already donating, um, I already donated a couple of dogs um, um, and, and sold a few dogs to police departments, but, I was given handling lessons um, with the dog. This was the first one that I just donated and trusted the, the department. This one went to the New York State Police and they brought it to, to Cooperstown. Is that, where, is that where they do it? And he was a good dog. I mean, he was a really good dog, ha ha had the right drives. And, but if you watch, you watched the video. We were just, you know, we were demonstrating. The dog did some muzzle work. Would uh, would engage, um, and then you can watch this video. And there's lots of videos of him biting Nate, and I'm petting the dog, and I'm loving him. He did nice bite. He would hold on. We did obedience with him. Um, he had great ball drive. I would play ball with him every day in the yard. Do the obedience. He'd give me his ball. Did not besides. Um, you know, I did not have a problem with this dog, but I also recognize, yes, that this is a very capable dog. He was, he was potentially a very tough dog, but with, with competence and understanding like this dog is, I am given, I am not going to give a dog or donate a dog or say, okay, I could donate this dog as a patrol dog unless I think this dog is tough enough to fight someone who also wants to hurt the dog. So remember, this is a tough dog. I would never have a police officer um, trust a, a dog that was not capable. But as a professional trainer, he was not something that was not handleable. All right. Um, never had a fight with the dog, anything like that. Well, anyway, I donated him to Cooperstown. Um, and within the third day, they, they put him with a handler in a course. And with the third day of training, I guess they decided it was a good idea to change his name to a cooler name from Brutus to Scar, not even realizing that the, the, the name was actually important um, to the dog as part of the training and had the guy wallop on the dog um, for not releasing a ball. You'll see a common denominator here with a lot of these where they just cannot get the dog to do simple things like to just drop something and there's reasons. And because the dog was trained to meet aggression with aggression, yeah, the dog, the handler was, he was not familiar with, was being aggressive to the dog. And the dog, yeah, latched on to the handler. And then the police officers within the prop, by what they proceeded to do was basically beat up the dog so bad that his ribs were all, his ribs were broken and all, uh, all four of his canine teeth were broken, were, all, were out of his mouth. Um, I got a call from them saying the vet recommended the dog be euthanized because he believes he was in um, 
um, a lot of pain from broken ribs. Um, make a long story short there, I got the dog. I said, no, I want the dog back. I got the dog back. Um, we did some basically rehabilitation, worked with them again to make sure that he trusts us and he was okay. And I adopted the dog out to another officer just to be used as with handling lessons. It's like, I'm never doing that again as a single purpose dog. He no longer had canine teeth. He couldn't be used as a, as a bite dog at that point. Um, so that was one of my first experiences, um, um, with, with police department. Now, I'm saying this, this first part of the lecture is I just want to make it known and I don't want to leave any doubt in anyone's mind that this is a real problem that exists everywhere from super local to across the globe. All right. This is not, this, this is not isolated things. What happened? I put this over here because, um, there was a series of seminars. This was, I believe after this, yeah, this was after this. Um, I, 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 what I did is I accepted an invitation to, to go to a seminar and to help out other offer. You know, there was, there was, a there was a, a, you know, a trainer search and rescue, um, trainers that were involved with, with, um, with working with, you know, these were all, these are all law enforcement, but to make a long story short, I was able to get in and work in these seminars and to help some police officers that wanted help, but did not want the help to involve getting their dogs beat up basically. All right. Now I went to the seminar, I went to three, I went to three different seminars as an instructor for police officers. Again, no bad guys there. Great handlers that wanted help. They wanted help. And there were other instructors there. But while I was there, it, there were some, some handlers that knew about me and wanted to work with me and, and my team of trainers. I went out there with, with different trainers to, um, to, to, to help out I was out there with, um, you know, depending on the seminar, I was out there with Nathaniel Benia. I was out there with Josh, Josh Jacobson of, of fearless canine, um, John Carney, John, John Frank. We went out there and we were helping these police officers. It was an amazing experience to see what we can do to repair a lot of their relationships um, with their dogs and to get better results by following a more, like just a more standardized, thoughtful technique to work on issues. Now, while I was there, the, the most experienced head trainer that was certifying the dogs um, on their, you know, so they have certificates that say they are capable of passing like obedience tests. All three times that I went to the, se to the seminars, all three times the head instructor had to go to the hospital for getting injured by police dogs that he took the leash and tried to show the right way to train them and punched them and hit them and did stuff like that. And the dogs retaliated on them. All three times the guy ended up in the hospital that I was over there. So all three times I was there, there were police dogs getting, getting, you know, with the trainers fighting them and the trainers getting injured. Also, what I saw is it was the norm in the open when they were doing training, yes, to hit their dogs, do kicks, hang their dogs, swing them around, joke and tell stories about the times they punched dogs, did this and taught this dog a lesson. It is the norm in at least a lot of circles of, um, of, of, of police dog training. Okay. Now I'm not saying all, all right, but I'm saying a lot. It is definitely a lot. And we got to dive deeper into it. All right. So here I'm not going to play all these videos, but they're in the, the, the notes. And by the way, anyone who's watching it, this stream this far, you will always, cause I think my more important streams, I like to have direct links so you can always find it. Um, I put behind me over here. There's, I just, I, I took the domain name, just police dog dot training. 
police dog dot training. If you know any officer that just wants to start getting information, a police officer, they can go directly to this stream and all the notes that we have over here. So at least there's some information. Knowledge is very powerful, all right? So that's why I have that back there. Police dogs, police, no, police dog dot training. Police dog dot training. I'm gonna go back, all right, um, to show. Now, this was a few years ago. Now, I put this, um, this, I'm putting just usual stuff. I wrote business as usual. I wanna show you the trend. This is a trend. This is a video from this year, which 100% reflects what my personal experience working with police officers. Now, there's two parts of this that are important. Is one, that it is definitely normal behavior for them to not really know how to train a dog the right way. And I'm gonna get into why. Two, it is normal even for their supervisors to justify it because they don't know any better either. They think it is normal because it is normal. It is normal for them. So you will see, even when they get caught on camera, you'll see the biggest concern is they just don't want to deal with the publicity of it. But none of these officers really get disciplined. They may, things happen because of the media, but ultimately they're not doing anything wrong. Actually, they don't deserve um, to get in trouble because this is the information that is given to them. They don't know more than this um, at all. I'm going to play just part, um, parts of this. Let's say police called a news conference after Fox 46 asked them about video that raises some questions on how an officer treated a canine. We want to warn you, some of you may find this video pretty disturbing. Fox 46 is Destiny McKeever live in Salisbury with what the chief had to say about that officer's actions. Paige, good afternoon. The chief had to basically say that this video is being reviewed right now as we speak. He says all of this is under investigation. And he says right now the canine and the officer have been separated as the investigation continues. I do want to warn you again, this video may be hard to watch. Take a listen. Yeah! Now, what we're looking at here, of course, is simply the dog just jumped the gun that there's going to be a bite scenario over here. The dog just simply anticipated, all right? The dog already knows that it did something wrong. It heard nay, which is a conditioned punisher. The punishment already happened, all right? Um, the punishment already happened. This was the dog just, it was an impulse control issue, right? The dog anticipated and... What happens next is not at all, um, it's abusive, all right? It's gonna be abusive. It can fidge, for sure I know it does damage the dog. It damaged the dog's trachea. I've seen Belize dogs, lots of them with damaged tracheas because of this. Two, it's, well, let's, 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 let's just watch this. This, is, this. this doesn't need an explanation at all. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so he's hanging the dog by a choke collar. We're good, no witnesses. Show him this is normal. All right, just protocol, make sure no one's watching, laughing. Normal. This is normal. Banging it against the car. Yeah. Hits the dog. How, hung the dog, threw it in the car, hits it over the head. Oh, no, my power, though. I think mine's on. Hey, you can put my cameras on. Just the front camera. No. Huh? And police would not say when or where this occurred. We asked police to explain the officer's actions and tell us more about what he 
had to say. The police gave a limited statement on the matter, but would not take further questions. The K-9 is Officer Zul, and the police chief says Zul will be back out on the street today because he was not harmed in the incident. He cautions those who watch to watch the video and not take it out of context. When a canine is non-compliant with the handler's commands, the uh, handler is trained to correct the dog. Canine training tactics and corrective measures can sometimes be al alarming when provided out of context. Okay, so a lot of that's self-explanatory, all right? It is not only, um, not only is that is that training just, it's abusive training and it's, it's unnecessary. Uh, it's unnecessary. We can prove that it's not necessary. It is, it's normal. It is accepted that it's actually going to be defended within the organization. Um, so, and this is, this is going to be, this is going to be the norm. All right. So, that happened, and then this is another one. This is the one that just finally prompt. I mean, this is, I get these videos all the time, all right? This is, this happens all the time, but I'm just showing ones that happened this year, all right? Just, just these two that, this happens every single, believe me, this is happening um, every single day. Now let's go over here. This is the one that really prompted me um, because I've been getting, um, I've been getting some, you know, some people that have been writing me on Facebook and saying, please, that I should do something. And I feel it is my duty to do something. Matter of fact, this video that I'm going to show this one, and there was another one within the past year, I was contacted by Inside Edition to help them do stories about this. And I did stories about it. And I was so excited. I was like, we're going to at least get some awareness to what's going on. But two stories on um, police dogs being abused were bumped for fluffier stories, or there was also a lot of political stuff going on. The, the stories were just not important enough for the air. And I was really upset about it because I've done obviously a lot of stuff for them, but this is one that I really believed in. I thought was really important, but at the same time, it's, I, I'm almost glad I'm just going to do it this way because you never know how things are going to be spun on TV. I do not think, again, we're, we're going to have anger toward that police officer and then towards the, the chief. But I'm telling you, they do not know any better. They actually believe that's what they're supposed to do. Um, let's go to this one. This one was in this, this one was in California. And this is a well. I'll 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 play this one, and this is going to dig us in deeper into the issue. We'll we'll dive a little bit deeper into this one. The dog was crying. The dog was crying like somebody was running him over or something like that. It was bad crying. Robert Palomino was on his way to work Monday morning when he heard sounds of a dog yelping. A warning: this footage may be disturbing to some of you. The Vacaville police officer seen in this clip is sitting on top of his canine partner, punching him. According to police, the officer was doing routine training in the back parking lot of Vacaville Fire Station 73. Before the video, at least I saw him giving at least 10 punches to the dog. At least. And for how many minutes was that dog? Um, I was able to notice for like at least five minutes. Vacaville Police Captain Matt Leiden says the canine handler was conducting a search for narcotics. The dog performed well, so his handler rewarded the dog with a toy. At the conclusion of that, the dog wasn't uh, willing to give up the toy. And in the handler trying to obtain the toy, uh, the dog became angry with the handler and lunged uh, in an attempt to bite the handler. Thank goodness that did not happen. Is punching a dog 10 times really necessary? Well, I'm not uh, prepared to speak to anything that, uh, that I did not observe myself. Renee Lancaster is a retired police officer and has been a canine handler for 22 years. She's trained police dogs for 15 law enforcement agencies across the Bay Area. Would you train your canine like that? Well, I wouldn't sit on my dog and, and punch it as a first choice, no. Now, I, I want to notice something. Even these police officers, you have to listen to what they're saying. Oh, I wouldn't do that as a first choice. No one is 
condemning this and, and any, they're very careful of what they say. And I'll jump ahead. I think we have the, the chief speaking again over here. Um, of dominance, which is common in police, the dog oh, in go. a position of dominance. Years, but is only a few months into the department's six month canine training program. The canine handler placed the dog in a position of dominance, which is common in police canine training, uh, to create that dominance and teach that dog who's in charge. Is that acceptable behavior? We're always looking at better ways to train, making sure that we're in compliance with our policy and procedures. But Palomino says it didn't. Okay, so that's really it enough seem for like that training. One. Um, all right, so what we're what I want to show at this point is like that there's definitely bad training going on with police officers. Now, some of this is directed. Someone's gonna if someone's watching the stream, they need to have at least some background in, in training and understand that hitting a dog, um, um, the idea of sitting on top of a dog to create dominance is not in any modern respected dog training circles is not recommended is not even accurate from a behavioral point of view that it would create dominance um with the with the dog and will is actually more likely to create more conflict and aggression keep in mind too this is i looked up at this dog this dog was a little bit over a year old um, if this is an adult canine, um, matter of fact, if the dog has what it takes to stand up for itself, you wouldn't want any good, capable canine police dog is going to hurt the police officer for trying to do this to them. All right. Just because you are the handler does not mean that you can necessarily just do anything to that dog. Also keep in mind, um, these are the same dogs, the same bloodlines that pet people have nowadays. Um, um, if a police officer drove by on the road and saw someone doing this to their dog, I am sure that person could get arrested. So I just want us to keep this stuff in, in mind over here. If they're hanging the dog, they're doing all this stuff. Now it gets, there's, there's, there, there's more to this, all right? There's, there's more to this. So, um... I dug into their, this police department, they have like a transparency portal, um, which I have the link over here. And what it has here is it has downloads. You know, um, it has downloads that because of all the public scrutiny, they had um, one place anchor therapy, assess the situation, you know, assess the situation, what was going on with the dog. And Again, no bad guys here. Um, the assessment, which came from the guy that owned the company, was an ex, looked like, I think, military dog trainer. It addressed all these things that were wrong with the department, but not the training technique at all. It was like, oh, the dogs on Cosequin, which is an over-the-counter medication for joints without a veterinarian's approval. And, oh... There's not enough hours written down, you know, that, you know, that this dog is getting training, not about the quality of the training or how the dog is being trained. There's actually nothing. There's stuff there in the assessment that basically says like, yeah, this police department is not doing their job, but not in any way addressing the training technique, only that it's not having enough of training with the the, you know, the, the training contractor that they use, which is where these people are obviously usually learning this stuff from to begin with. Then um, the department had another assessment to basically defend them. Again, the guy who did this assessment um, was like 20 something years police handler and now does assessments to help improve um, canine programs to, to make them less liable. Now, I'll, Again, what I have to say is both of both of the assessments came from people that were trying to do the right thing. They both offered suggestions. They're both trying to improve the situation. All right. But in both of them, the second evaluation just discusses the alpha role as if it's just any other training technique. None of them actually address the technique. Only it's, you know, there's 
There's a, a tit for tat about like, you know, about the assessments and this one's defending that, the you know, that the, the program is not so bad, but yes, there is a need for improvement. It's, it's two different evaluators, both trying to do the right thing. None of them with bad intentions, but neither of them are offering solutions about the fact that there's an officer sitting on a dog and punching it. All right. Um, it's not in there. It's just not in there. And, and, and this is normal. Right. This is this is going to be normal. Um, and I've been following this stuff for years. There's um, if you want to get even just to show that this is consistently happen and gain even more details. I put a link over here to a, a North Carolina Highway Patrol incident where there was this dog named name name Ryko. Now I haven't in, this this is pretty good because there's a whole Wikipedia page on it and there's lots of links within the. Uh, within the references, but so this stream doesn't go forever because this could potentially be a very long stream. The nutshell of this story is the same thing. There's a common denominator here, all right? These are police officers that cannot even, that get into fights with their dogs over like taking a toy away. Turns into a street battle where they're, so in this case, it was the dog, the handler, took his dog because the dog would not give him the ball he took the dog and hung it over a rail and there's videos and everything in there no need to it's, it's gonna be the same thing over and over again so he hangs the dog over a rail so it's dangling and he's kicking it while it's dangling and another officer tapes it um and then he leaves the dog hanging there um and, but the guy gets fired because there's a videotape now it's the same thing the guy got fired but then he eventually sued and got rehired because he was able to prove that this is normal, that this is what he was taught. And I'll even go to this. This is just one of the articles in there. Um, no one, no one ever got in trouble. The guy just got his money back and it wasn't addressed. It was just, that's the end of the case. It's out of the media. That's, that's the end of it right there. Um, I, what, this was from the references, which explain, which shows some stuff, an article. I'll, I'll, I'll read this one quick if it pops up. I think this was a pretty slow, slow rank. But ruling, rehire, this is short enough. I could read this one. Um, Howie Patrol Trooper, who kicked and hoisted his canine partner off the ground by its neck, should be rehired to the job he lost after videos of the mistreatment surface. A judge ruled. So a judge ruled he should be rehired. Um, Superior Court judge ruled in order signed Monday that former North Carolina Highway Patrol Sergeant Charles Jones was improperly fired, which is correct. I actually agree. Hardin said Jones also should regroup back pay and attorney's fees. I actually agree with this decision because this is not what it's about. It's about that the issues are not being solved. Two 15 second video clips show the training, the, the training coordinator for the agency's canine unit this is the training coordinator doing it, all right? Um, suspending his dog from a railing and kicking him to force him to drop a chew toy. Jones said he was training the dog to obey. Hardin ruled that although Jones's actions were not among the training techniques specifically approved by the Highway Patrol, they were no worse than the agency's accepted methods, um, which included whipping dogs, hitting them with sticks, and using choke collars and stun guns. Um, there was, I read testimonies where they took this dog and they gave him the release. They actually used a stun gun to shock him to the point where he was unconscious with a stun gun to get the ball from him. Like this is the kind of crazy stuff that they're going and that happens. And what happens is after this comes out of the media, that's that. It's like, oh, that's accepted. That that's, that's accepted. Okay. And that's, that's where it ends. That's where it ends. And this is still in 2021 is what is still going on right now. Yes. And Dave, I see what you said, that some temperaments fight back and you're, you're correct. And we're, we're going to get into it, right? There's, um, there's, I said, this is such a big subject. I'm sorry. This is why it took me, let's see, I'm going to, I'm going to go through this and, and there's, there's, there's going to be links, um, what what I did is I looked at I, I collect this stuff right I have any type of public manual and and and, and policy that I find I, I like to collect this stuff I cannot find anything 
um, with 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 dogs and police departments or or any government agency that has any type of like addresses these type of issues or any type of quality quality training on. What I did is, and I was like, and where are these handlers coming? A lot of these, and I told you, I told you about my experience in the other streams where I worked with some, with ex-military trainers that were beating up, beating up their dogs. And it's like, doesn't the U.S. government with their, with all the money and these, 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 um, these working dog programs, like, don't they have like better training technology that's out there? What I did is I found... Um, I found the most recent declassified publication that I can find about their training. I have, you can download the whole, the whole manual at the bottom of the page. And it was, um, it was in 2015. So, um, when this one was published, so it's pretty recent and it's the, um, it's a military working dog manual. This one, um, was from the, was the Marines version, but it's based off of within if you read through there it's based off of what they're doing um at lackland air force base over there which is what is they're the ones that sort of like um they're the head of all the training for all the branches now i just i just put some screenshots of of some important points over here all right now this is first one from the this is the military Clear signals training method. In the last 10 years, enormous technical progress has been made in the methods used to train working dogs for obedience and controlled aggression. The most important advances were made by... Now, now please, amateur trainers, all right? This is the military. The most important advances were made by amateur trainers, who compete in obedience competition. The methods developed for use by the DOD's military work and dog program is called the clear signals training. All right. Now I got to dig into this before, you know, so some of you are going to be like, why is that so bad? All right. Why is that so bad? Okay. That the military is basing their manuals and SOPs off of amateur trainers that train their dogs in obedience, competition, on a grass field with nothing going on, in a predictable environment where they don't even need a relationship with the dog, where the dog doesn't even need to be able to, you can, uh, you, these dogs, they don't even have to be able to, to live with the human properly or do anything in the real world, all right? They, they, they don't even need to be praised to compete or, or pet or have a relationship or be able, I mean, I mean nothing, all right? Uh, it's based off of fake stuff, right? It's based off of fake stuff. Um, this is what they're basing it off of, all right? Now, we're going to dig into this more, okay? Um, a clear signals training method is, is founded on three very important ideas. Teach skills with rewards, not physical force. Establish clear communication. Use compulsion only when necessary and use it in a fair and effective fashion. Now, this sounds really nice and is really good, but this is going to take us back. I'm going to scroll up to our, our, our Bloom's hierarchy here, all right, where... Everything I found in their manuals is based off of like, they'll have some good little theories and lower level stuff like, oh, this sounds good. But there's, when it comes to applying the stuff or analyzing or evaluating, it's, it's just not there. You'll find like, you'll find the definitions of operant conditioning and you find all these things in theory that sound really good. But the hands-on application is amateur. It is amateur. Matter of fact, uh, it, it's, it's, it is amateur because it's based off of am it's based off of mimicking amateurs. All right. It's based off of mimicking amateurs. Um, now let's go, let's, let's go into it. Or I'm going to prove my point here. So they're giving examples. Remember, this is for military. Teach down. So this is how you start it. Teach dog how to lie down for food and then transition to a ball, ball kong or reward. Okay, how are we, 
what are the details of how we're doing this? All right, then we're going to ball reward. All right, but I understand they're just trying to give an example. Then two, um, my these are what this is established clear communication. I guess this is the step two, clear communication. Train the dog to turn off mild collar correction and social correction um, by lying down or holding the dog down. All right, this is I cannot. This is so um, vague. And we're going to talk about what social correction is. Then on first command, you know, to finalize it, on first command, dog must lie down quickly and hold the down um, in order to avoid a sharp collar correction or strong social correction. Initially, dog given food, ball, kong frequently to reduce stress. Later, these primary rewards come out you know, get weaned out. Let's talk about social correction. All right, I, I put some here, social correction. This is the military, high technology. These are the guys that have like, uh, like, like what, like billion dollar bombers, like technology and like have all this crazy technology. So what is social correction that they're teaching the military? Slaps or cuffs of the foot, hand or leash end or poke of the fingers <laughs> or poke, um, uh, poking the dog with stiffened fingers, especially when the handler's intent is to stop the dog from moving forward or biting. Such corrections have the advantage that they do not depend on the presence of leash and collar. And therefore, if used properly, give the handler greater control over the dog in a wide range of situations. Uh, appropriate, effective, and humane examples are the handler commands the dog to lie down while the military work and dog team is healing rapidly forward. Um, as they may in a, in a fire zone, the dog does not lie down quickly and the handler slaps the dog on the back or neck or ears with the hand or the leash end. The handler then heals forward again rapidly and repeats the command. And if the dog complies rapidly is praised and petted and given a food reward while in the down position. So, so remember there, I'm just talking about the, the ridiculousness of this. All right. That, um, so we have. We have time to give a food reward, but we don't have time to like do proper training or handling or use a leash or high technology tr um, training tools. So you can have the dog off leash, but you could slap this dog and hit this dog. And, and we're not even going to get into, all right, like I'm trying to break this down. There's so many reasons why this is just bad and it reflects in everything you see going on in police departments. And even on the news where you hear police have to shoot their own dogs, they get attacked by their own dog. So, yeah, this is great. We want to see a handler get attacked by his own dog now um, 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 in, in, in a fire zone. All right. Um, so, all right. Um, two, the handler commands the dog to release a ball. Sound familiar? Um, all of these handlers having issues with their dog releasing a ball. The dog does so, and as the ball drops to the ground and he reaches to take the ball, but as he or she does so, the dog attempts to bite the ball, um, and thereby the handler's fingers. And this happens accidentally all the time, all right? If someone um, is, is, does, you know, is not careful training, training their dogs, there's ways to handle this. The handler says no and cuffs the dog sharply on the side of the muzzle with the open palm of the other hand. As a result, a moment later, the dog is somewhat tentative in taking the ball from the handler's hands, even when invited to do so. And the handler praises and encourages um, this respect for his or her hand's fingers. Um, okay, so the stuff we're seeing in the videos, right? The guy hitting the dog, another video hitting the dog. Remember, this is, this one go, it's not their fault. They're being taught this stuff. It's, they're being taught that that this is what you do. And there's huge gray area and room for interpretation of what these guys are allowed to do with their dogs, all right? And we're not even gonna get in, I, I can't even get each one of these points we could probably do a whole stream about, about all the side effects and what you wouldn't wanna do. Like the only point of me presenting this right now is that it's in writing. One, we have a real problem. This is really happening, it's real life. Officers fighting with dogs as their as their training method. Two, 
it is accepted, it is taught, it is in the manuals at the highest level in, in the, the government. We won't, we won't go into side effects yet. We have to, we have, to have patience and go through the, go through the whole, whole uh, stream. Three, um, the handler holds the dog on a six foot leash and gives the heel command, but the dog is distracted by nearby activity and reluctant to obey and keeps turning its head and four quarters away and pulling into the leash, making it difficult for the handler to get enough slack on the leash to give a pop in leash correction. So the handler uses um, the instep of his or her foot to slap the dog sharply um, on the big muscles of the back of the thigh, all right? So it's kicking the dog with the underside of its foot to get the dog's attention. The dog startles turns to look at the handler and the hands are instantly encouraged the dog to come by praising it and running backwards and then giving the dog a ball reward. All right. Like as if this is going to happen in a combat zone, like that's what you're going to do. You're going to kick your dog and then run backwards and give a, and give a, give a ball reward. Now. Um, okay. I'm going to jump around a bit over here. All right. First, I'm going to go up to this whole competition thing. First, we're going to talk about the social. I mean, it's very obvious that the high level government manuals are getting their information from like TV, right? Part of it is just from watching TV and watching Caesar Milan. I guess there's a Caesar Milan fan um, that's working at, at the government, all right? And we got, uh, we got the poking. Now, they are dealing with dogs that are s selectively bred to be aggressive to respond to aggression with aggression. From birth as a puppy, the breeders are slapping them around and hitting them with things and they want the dogs to bite harder. Um, aggression creates more aggression. They're supposed to react towards aggression, all right? Then the dog acts aggressive towards the handler, the handler gets more aggressive towards the dog, then eventually someone's in the hospital, all right? Usually, usually both, usually the dog and the handler. Um, Let's watch this. Let's watch a poking technique, okay? Um, again, now Caesar Milan, I'm putting Caesar Milan here. So Caesar Milan's not a bad guy. There's no standards saying that he's not allowed to train dogs. Matter of fact, he's out there trying to help people because no one else would, all right? He was approached for a TV show, but guess what? He's on TV. He doesn't have any real education on this stuff. He's doing the best he can, but it's good enough for the government, right? It's 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 good enough for the government. Let's watch what happens when you you're poking. This is normal with a dog that has the temperament to defend itself. See, that's unsure. That's not submission. Okay, good girl. Right. So aggression was caused. The poke, the dog wasn't even shown aggression. The, the aggression from the handler is the thing that started the aggression. Now, if you watch this dog's body language, you're going to see defensive and actually fearful body language, right? This was not a dog that was even looking to attack anyone, but the dog has the instinct, even this lab has, you know, more pronounced than, you know, the average lab is, is going to have, but normal for a lot of mili for, for military working dogs to, to be able to defend themselves. And this dog is scared. His dog is still willing to defend itself. Now, what is the side effect of using your hands to hurt the dog? All right. We see this as fearful body language, squinted, eyes squinted, everything pushed back. Now, let's see. Watch what happens here. So, what happens now the next yeah, time he goes to put his hand near this dog's because face? The brain is got stuck this way. Yeah. So just stay there. She didn't do that to you earlier. No, not like that. Right. <laughs> No, no, not at all. Okay. Yeah. Go it's, forward. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an understanding. 
Okay. These are side effects. This is the military. This is what the military is is telling people to telling people to do in their in their manual. The kick. This is exactly the technique that's described to a T um, with the military in the military manual. You're healing with the dog. The dog's paying attention to something else. Kick it with your foot to get its attention. And then, yeah, be happy and like have a ball or something. But let's see how well that works with a dog that ha genetically is aggressive. We're not talking about an, an average golden retriever here. Um, we're talking about military working dogs. So have you, you experienced uh, the behavior you saw before be yeah. with him? So okay. Those aren't my words. I got this. All right, watch this. As soon as he kicks this dog, the dog is looking... This is, it's sad that this is what the military is suggesting, all right? They're causing a problem, all right? Watch this. I'll put this in. Watch. It happens very quick. The dog looks at the other dog. He does exactly what they say to do in the manual. It triggers the dog to attack the handler. The handler now becomes the threat. Uh, the behavior you saw before be yeah. with him. Watch your okay. dog looks, kicks. Now we have an attack on the handler, and now he's has to choke, choke the dog at this point. All right, now the dog's fending for its life. It doesn't know what's going on. All right, it turns into a war. That ends with the dog basically passed out on the floor from getting, from getting choked out. All right, so we have. Dog looks. This is just, I'm just showing you. This is what's in the manual. Um, yeah. Aggression. Aggression causes, causes aggression. Now, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go, go back, all right? It, it's um, different points. It's there. So it's based off of TV and it, it's, it's based off of amateur trainers who compete in obedience competition, all right? We, we threw out. Somewhere along the line, everything else was was thrown out in their in their manuals, and we're gonna we're gonna do what we see in, in competition. Now, um, problem number one, right? So I'm gonna put this. Actually, problem number one was uh, the social the social corrections, all right? Which was I had it listed as 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 problem as problem number number two, all right? This was the problem number one, all right? Somewhere along the way, working dog trainers started to model competition training. I want to make it clear that that competition training is not the same as real world training. And I, I put, um, you know, we have a Labrador here doing some IPO training or something. Let me lower this down. Now, what I the point I'm trying to make here is, first of all, the training methods that are used in competition is it's. It's for a competition on a field that is based off of, it's based off of charades, right? It's meant to win points. Nothing you see in competition is usually real. So they're going to use completely different training techniques. For example, in vast majority of competition, taken into account that yes, there could be dogs cross-trained and, and other things, and there could be dogs that are cross-trained in real obedience. But if we're using the competition model to train military dogs, one, everything they're doing with aggression is based off of fake stuff. You know, it's 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 based off of not real aggression. It's based off of play when you when you break it down. So I'm showing like a Labrador doing it. And then I just put a link over here showing you world championships dogs doing competition. And you're going to really what you're going to see as impressive as it is. I don't want to take away from the hard work that any trainer does to be the best at anything um, because it is impressive. There, some of these trainers are working a long time. Yes, to become a world champion or just to get the title. I'm not taking them away from it, but sometimes we have to be real. Even the world champion of of these of a lot of these dog sports, it remember it, it remember what it is the cha the champion of. It is the champion of taking a very well bred dog, specifically bred 
to do well in that specific environment in a blank, in a green field with no distractions in a predictable environment where they have to do it like once for, for a title where almost everything is fake. When you watch these videos, when they do the blind searches, they're not really using their nose and searching. They're just trained to weave through them to look like they're searching. And then it's predictable where the person is. They know where the person is. It's They're just being trained to look like they're searching and then to go to the, to the next blind to bark. The protection is fake. It is fake. The barking is not based off of real aggression or really thinking the person is a threat. It's based off of frustration. It's barrier frustration. And they're biting the sleeve because they're biting because they want the sleeve. They want the toy. All right. It's the, the tracking. It's, it's fake tracking. Right. The dogs are trained to track footsteps, usually laid by the person in training who's handling the dog ultimately. So they run, they do the track and the dog thinks it's finding food inside of footsteps. And then the same person who laid the track during training usually sends the dog on, on the search. And it looks like they're tracking where in reality, if they're really tracking a person, they would turn around and be like, oh, it's you dummy. You're the one that laid this track, right? Like pretty much everything is pretty much everything you see is fake. The obedience is fake by fake. I mean, the dogs are doing it. They're not if you watch them and you understand the training, they're obeying and they're wagging their tail and they're looking happy because they're usually obsessed with a toy that they think they're going to get, or they're obsessed with the bite that they think that they're going to get um, as, as a reward in this situation, where if you take them off of this training field and just have the dog hang out with the handler... Um, and take a walk around New York City, the dog is not going to be able to do that obedience, all right? Unless the, the they're going to be waving a ball in front of the dog the whole time. It, it is not the way that you train for real life. It is it, it is not. It's it's a show, all right? It's a, it's a show that people are watching, all right? And again, there are trainers that are very good at competition and are very good working with real life dogs and they can separate the two and they're not going to train the dogs the same way but to model competition or amateur trainers that are the champion at doing something on a green field and then model that training to be used in a dynamic environment with chaos going on and gunshots and and where the police officer has to worry about all these different things and not having a ball underneath them or having a having a bunch of having a, bu a bunch of treats and all these things like that it's not going to be it just doesn't work so now when we go into if if you go into like um, some of the recommendations that we saw over here for the California incident and all, really, really everything I could find about his requirements for police dogs, the, the, the thing that they most have in common is they want to see a certification that the dog is trained. The certification is simply that the dog must pass a competition style test like that. Now, not how they are trained. There's no, it doesn't dive in deeper like that. Now, I could pull up, it's in other videos. We can't spend all day in, in demonstrating things. The way you get the dog to do well on that training field could be anything but for the day, you know, making the dog think it's going to get a treat the whole time. And I've seen this. I've been to seminars where the, the trainer will do anything just to get the dog to look good on that grass field. And sometimes it takes them days to just get that minimum amount in the most easiest amateur environment ever, just to get a certification that says the dog can sit, the dog can down. And often it's just that one time that the dog can do it. Often it's after they beat the crap out of the dog to get the dog to let go and perform everything once on the field. Like how they get the dog to pass that test, it doesn't really matter. It's like, that's really the extent of it. That's, that's, really, the, that's really the extent of it right, right there. Um, let's move on here because, all right. Um, yeah. So alpha roll slaps, kicks in with the leash, stringing the dog up, helicopter, swing and smash. I've seen all this stuff. I mean, it just gets, 
it's um it's normal solution don't do it period it causes side effects and damage at all you don't even need a repl the replacement behavior is just you got to learn proper training right the proper training is out there it's accessible you don't have to do it now here goes another thing this is a problem and this is because this is part of the modeling um, um, competition dog problem is is um, properly bred dogs come out of the womb with the instincts to do the right thing. Um, these look like some properly bred Malinois and I'll, I'll play this, right? They're just, oh my gosh. All right. Um, I'm gonna play the whole thing. It's just, this does not require any training. I have had litters of working dogs. My son is traumatized from my litters of working dogs, right? This fantasy is, oh, you could play a puppy, so I'm gonna have these working dogs. It didn't take any training for them just to all latch on to my, my, my son who was young at the time and just drag him all over the floor and he's crying. I'm like, oh crap, all right? And then to do this to me and do this to me. They come out of the womb doing this. And, and this is why it's so easy for someone to, to get into training police dogs or or providing police dog services, especially nowadays, because you're going to see there's there's real no good requirements of control. The things that impress people are the things that the dogs do naturally anyway, all right? These dogs, it almost anyone can point these dogs at someone to have them bite someone. Almost anyone can get these dogs if someone runs away from them in the woods to get them to find someone, right? We're talking about instincts. Most of the stuff that they do is a natural instinct. And then almost anyone, and this is a quote from Bob Bailey, right? Bob Bailey, it's like almost anyone doing any training method on any animal can eventually get the dog to do any behavior, right? Because dogs and any animal, they have evolved to learn. Right. Eventually, they figure out what you want to do. All you may have all kinds of side effects along the way, and it may not be efficient, and you may cause all kinds of damages along the way. All right. They're pretty smart. Right. It's it's not that hard, even if you have no experience, to get a dog to sit, to the you know to to down, to look like it could walk nice on the le on the leash for at least a few moments to pass to pass the test. But they come out of the womb. They really do come out of the womb doing the stuff. Now. Going back to um, competition, um, competitive dogs, they're not, they're, they're not doing, they're not really facing a threat and they get judged on how intense they look and stuff like this. So what happens is there's a phenomenon that really was born in, um, that was really born in the sport world. Um, because I've never found the need for it doing real police dogs or real protection dogs to bring it to this extent where they call it drive billing. Occasionally you hear people call it by the correct name, which is basically frustration building <laughs> or um, where what they're doing. I'll show you a video is is prey drive, right? You don't. In my opinion, you do not build more prey drive. If you have a dog that has the right genetics, right? So we're talking about thology here. If someone hunts boars, wild boars, they have a good line of bulldog, hog cat, any type of catch dog. They are not going to need to like do anything crazy to build conflict and, and make the dog frustrated in order to bite the boar. They're do, the animal is going to do this pretty naturally, all right? It's pretty naturally. They're just going to kind of point the dog. You give it some experience so it gets better. Mother nature takes its course, right? They're going to keep the dog safe. They're going to do these other things. And they're mostly just shaping the control. And this is, you could take anything, any dog that's properly bred for a purpose. They're mostly doing it on their own. So you can have all kinds of all kinds of examples with hunting dogs and bird dogs and catch dogs and things that bite terriers that are killing rats. All right. You don't need to do much with the properly bred dog to get it to bite and hold on what it's supposed to, what it's supposed to be doing now, because somehow slowly competition became something different. All right. It's a big charade techniques that are used for competition to make a dog look more intense 
are working its way into have worked their way. I don't even know how long it's been there. It's like, why is this? Ha I've started seeing this. I probably started seeing this like 10 years ago and to, uh, to a ridiculous extent. All right. To a ridiculous extent. Now, I'm going to give you an example. Now, first of all, this video I'm going to show, I'm not going to say any names of trainers. There's actually a trainer in here who I think is an excellent trainer. So I don't want, this is not a bad mouth. I'm not even going to say his name. I don't do anything. Excellent trainer. I saw some really, really awesome things with this guy. Like knows, like he, he, he knows his stuff. All right. And he's pretty scientific about, about his training. Um, um, I do not think this is a bad trainer at all. And matter of fact, I think what he's doing would is actually good. If you were training a competition dog that was not intense enough, that did really not have enough drive and you're trying to get the dog to go over the hump. But now, if you have a dog that comes out of the womb and really does not need to be any more intense, what we're gonna see, it is not, this is labeled, how to build drive in puppies. What kind of drive, right? What we're going to see is a, the, the puppy is going to have the drive. What you're going to see is going to create frustration in this video. So I'm 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 going to play it and I'm going to explain as we as we go along. Um, right, so, now what he's doing? If you watch some like protection videos we have, there yeah bite building, things like that. All right. We don't want this to get confused. Like some trainers, which is, I think is good. They'll wave tugs in front of the dog and then they'll, they'll let the dogs reach for it for the purpose of the bite for teaching the dog to strike, to, to stretch out. This exercise is deliberately caught done to cause frustration and to get the dog to bark for frustration and don't let the dog bite until it is barked and the barking is a manifestation of frustration. We're building frustration um, in the dog as part of the training where we're associating the whole biting process with frustration. Now, remember, a real police dog does not have to fake its fake its aggression. All right. It doesn't even matter if a police dog barks. You just send it with someone. But here is. I say, now maybe this dog is going to be used for competition or for sport, but there is no discrimination between what you should be doing with a sport dog and what you should be doing with a police dog. So here, this dog He's a drivey little yeah. right here. is we're frustrating the dog and... You guys, I don't want to take, they're waiting for the dog to get very frustrated and bark a certain way before it gets to actually bite it, all right? So it's not even about the bite at this part, it's about frustration, all right? Now I'm going to move forward, and over here, you got to watch the presentation. We're having the handler, again, do things where the handler is constantly restraining and trying to pull the dog away from the bite and it's being used to get to to prompt the dog to bite in deeper there is a scientific in itself the thought process is very smart what this trainer is doing right like this is a good trainer i'm going to tell you where the problem is all right let me see let's just watch what he's doing again this is not necessarily bad training it's 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 you have to be careful what you're doing with the dog for what purpose that you're putting them into. And if there is cohesiveness in the training right up to the point where the dog is being used for something. So um, let's see. Let's watch. I'm going to move ahead a little over here. Okay. They got a garden barking barn at PSA. Well, you never know. The scenarios could, could be that they do. You know, PSA doesn't really have... The scenarios are different every every trial. Have you ever had a dog PSA? Or? And I hear them talking about PSA, right? So perhaps this dog's going to be used for PSA, which is a sport, all right? So like I say, please, there's no bad guys here. I never competed in PSA at all. I've only been to a couple PSA events in my life. I lived with a, one of the best trainers in PSA, but... Yeah. Let's go forward. This? I pull if I'm his head, if I'm the so I can come up behind him. I can pull him back like this. If I'm his head, if I'm the handler, I can do it like Pay this. Pay attention to this. I pull him this back. This is going to be important for the next video. He wants to go forward. 
The other way is I can keep them on a leash. This is not really a leash, but I'll pretend that it is. Can you see this? So if I'm going to work them by myself, I'm going to just choke them off in this a little bit. Watch the dog here, all right? So from a young age with the puppy, they're having the dogs be exposed to being choked and that's going to be the way they're getting them to release, all right? So the dog is going to hold on and be frustrated and hold on to its last breath until this thing could come out. And then it's actually they're be them letting go, their behavior of letting go leads to frustration, all right? It's like a punishment, all right? They don't want, they're being trained, hold on no matter what, especially if you get this back pressure. And if I let go, it's going to lead to frustration, not satisfaction. It's what they, this is what they want to do, all right? Let's say if this is what the plan is, it's a good plan. But is it a good plan for dogs that end up becoming police dogs with handlers that don't have proper training? So just, just watch this a bit. <laughs> Choking the dog. So this is the kind of possession that, you know, that we're hoping to build. Right, here. all right? Possessiveness that we're hoping to build. So if this is my leash, All right. wait till So when the dog finally lets go, it leads to more frustration. The dog doesn't know really give me some power. Back. All right, I'm just I'll end this end this one here. Now we're gonna give solution. All right, I'm gonna give little tidbits of solutions. Right, like this is generally you're working with like a real life dog. I would say even any dog. I would say even it's even better for for um, even for sport. All right is one of the reasons why we're gonna have no no like conflict um with if you're training a dog using certain steps that i think police officers should use is generally even from a young age you want to think the dog you don't want to associate the handler with conflict that the presence of this handler means choking and and frustration if i let go especially from a very early age, while this is getting imprinted into them, right? Um, you will see in other videos, and, and I, I put links in here, right? I'm not just speaking out of my butt here and not going to offer solutions. You can train a dog that can be very, very good as a police dog with not building conflict. Um, um, you can do bite building. You can encourage proper bites with ignoring any reason for them to have to be frustrated. Releasing, from a young age, you can teach them that releasing is good. You know, that if we prompt them to release, by them releasing, they're actually gonna get something better, all right? They're gonna get the bite again. And there's ways to incorporate it into the training so it makes sense and it's usable, and it makes sense on paper that, it, that it'll be easy to get the dog to let go. It's 100% it's it's 100% possible, all right? It's 100% possible. I show it in instru instructional videos. Now, I'm gonna go over here because I want you to watch that because I see this all the time, all right? Now, this leads to, again, this is gonna lead to conflict with the handler. Um, I mean, right? What are these handlers doing when the dog doesn't obey? They eventually start fighting the dog. But what happens when the camera is rolling and they can't start beating up their dog on camera? All right, I'm gonna play this one. Um, there's a link to this article over here, um, but I'll play, play this video. There's a whole article that goes along with this, but this is what's happening. Some of this is, is this it's, story. it's looking very, very bad to the general, to the general public. I'm going to skip ahead, right? Because this isn't about tactics, right? This I'm not talking about police tactics. I'm just talking about the training parts. Well, a lot of this is about the use of the dogs, which is a whole, which is a whole separate conversation. But I'm interested in the training and the side effects. So let's go up here, all right? Now let's watch this. Remember what we just saw with that puppy, all right? Now we don't know. Let's like, who raised this puppy? How are they training the puppy? Um, Let's see what happens here. In an interview with me, he told me he thought he was gonna die. And so he complies. He puts his hands behind his back. Despite the fact that he's on his stomach, his hands behind his back, the canine is used and mauls him. And you can also see um, something that is particularly troubling with a lot of these canine attacks. The canine handler is supposed to be able to, on command, 
get the dog to let go and that does not happen here. You see the handler trying to pull the canine off and the leg actually raises up with the dog continue to be latched on. And in that moment, a huge chunk of flesh was pulled from his leg and he is permanently disfigured because of it. Out of the 18 videos. Um, All right. So this is common. They, we don't understand the dog and what's driving them and how they're actually trained. There's no cohesiveness. Now, what that handler is doing is doing exactly with a puppy that the dog has been encouraged to resist. He's just pulling back on this dog. Um, he's pulling back on the dog. The dog obviously does not have an out command, um, does, not have, does not have an out command um, at all. And the dog, I have talked personally, face to face with trainers that I deeply respect that will take a puppy and tell me that I'm going to hold that dog and, and hold it right into the point where it, it's going to, it's going to have to let it go. It's, um, it's not going to be able to breathe, breathe anymore. And then I'm going to reward it for holding on by letting it go back in and bite. And the trainer was doing that to get even more intensity on the bite. So it's harder to get the bite off of that would already be already would be good enough. Believe me. Um, it doesn't, it, the dog would already be biting hard enough. Like the only thing we're teaching the dog, it's not building more prey drive. The dog is born with the prey drive where we're artificially building frustration and conflict in the dog. This is called conflict. Um, um, in, in dog training where, where the, 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 the dog is associating the handler with bad things. Um, let's see, I'm going to go, let's keep moving along here. Too much information. Um, solutions. Um, and I wrote these quick. I was, there was, this was to teach a dog to fight the, <laughs> all right. Um, yeah. So. To, to get solutions here, what I basically did was, um, is I did put some videos on the end. You can't give fast solutions, but I put lots of videos at, at, at the end of over here is we do not want to condition. We do not want to condition the, the puppy, um, to associate bites with frustration. Excessive frustration is not needed for real bite work, only necessary for sport work where the aggression is not real. All right. If, if you need to do that, it's the only time I've done, that's a valid technique, but I've done that with dogs that were like pet dogs that really needed to get over the hump um, to be able to bite and establish operations and stuff like that. It's, it's not something you should need for a police dog and it causes all kinds of problems, it causes all kinds of problems. Now I put this over here with, with the, um, with the birth of these hot, more and more frustrated dogs that are being selectively bred and chosen for, um, for the wrong behaviors, really. Um, now we have breaking sticks. Now I want to show you this officer. Um, this is real. This is happening. I heard this. I heard this the seminars I was at, even though it's pointless, they have these certifications where the dog has to out once while it gets scored by a judge. But then almost every police officer I talk to threw, throws in the towel about the dog really having an out in real life. They're like, oh, everyone knows the dog won't out in real life, which is BS, which is BS. I've trained dogs for officers not doing this. They are easily able to out. And I could even show you videos of dogs doing a great job that are able to out. And now what you have Again, no bad guys. There hasn't been one bad guy in this whole thing. Here's an example. Now you see things like breaking sticks that are being sold to police officers as, as part of their plan. So here goes a breaking stick. And I'm not going to read this whole thing. You guys could read it. But it basically says like, yes, we all know they don't really out in real life. That, that, that's it in a nutshell. So every handler should have one of these. And I believe this is sold by someone who trains police dogs and teaches um, handlers um, how to handle their dogs. And basically say, no, it's, it's, it's not a real thing. Take, take a break and stick. Now, um, again, no bad guys. I think um, most likely this 
whoever made it, they were making a solution because they really did not know how to get the dogs to let go because there is so much conflict involved in the training. And therefore, I do think I still even if even if I say no bad guys, even if a dog does out pretty good, I do think it's nice to have a backup, something like I'm not against the idea of a break stick. Those break sticks are like what they would use in pit bull fights to break up pit bull fights you know they the, the get them to let go without you know they would take a stick and basically put it in the dog's mouth and trigger a gag reflex um or mechanically wedge the wedge the wedge, there's different ways to do it to get the dog's mouth to open but it's a tool it's no training so what's happening now with a lot of police police dogs and police dog handlers and even trainers that don't have the education is they give it up on the out and their solution, again, this is actually a good, they're, they're moving in the right direction. They just admit that they can't do it. So they're just mechanically, it's like, we can't get the dog to, to obey us. So we're just going to mechanically pop the dog off. And then what they rely on is the handler holding the dog to restrain the dog so the dog can't go back and bite. Now, what happens is why we want to get away from this is I've had police dogs that I've given, they, poli officers are by themselves sometimes that have a dog. And when they have to get the, get the suspect to the car or something, they need control. They can't be holding their dog the whole time. Um, and what happens is now the hand, the, the officer does not have, does not have their, their hands free. And I have video too of a police officer that apprehends someone in one of the videos on the link that shows what a police dog can do that's usable, where you can have a dog bite and then you can out the, you can have someone cuffed. An officer can have a dog release and be right there at ready to bite again. All right. These are while the officer has his hands free to do other things. All right. Like it is actually possible. It's been going, it was training and handling is going backwards. We're getting, they're just throwing in. They're throwing in the towel with this with this sort of stuff, um, um, and and that's what's it's it's part of the bigger issue. But this is a side effect of having these frustrated dogs, which brings us to um, another thing. I don't think it's in, it's in the notes. Was is usability? Is if the equipment, the dog, is too intense for your training technology, the dog is not usable, all right? There's something called usability. And this goes into ABA, right? We're talking about ABA. Is Does your plan, does is it usable? Is it effective in the real world? So if you have a plan and it's not actually effective, if the dog is too intense for your training and it's causing problems, then perhaps change something. If you're not gonna change your training so much, change the type of dog that you're using. And for sure, the excuse that these are very intense dogs and we have to do, that's not true, all right? I have, I have plenty, of, I don't know, I lost count of the stories of trainers that I worked with have, that have gotten dogs because they were too intense for the police officers. They couldn't get the dog to let go. The dog was attacking the canine handler because of the methods. Usually the best dogs, if they're the most capable dogs, if you put them with a trainer, a handler that does not know what they're doing and is clashing with the dog, it's just gonna turn into a fight and they're not gonna be able to handle the dog and actually end up with inferior working dogs. So this argument that that you know that they say is not true and when we bring these dogs into the civilian world where yeah where you're doing classes and things like that and you can't just uh, openly abuse the dogs believe me if you just say no i'm not going to do that um you can find a way to do it if someone pays you as a civilian someone gives me a dog an intense dog and it's in contract that i need the dog to do do real bite work, let go, whether it's for security or personal protection or something, is I have to be accountable and I can show that it works and I can make a plan that makes sense on paper and you can and you can apply it. Which brings us to um, problem four, which is which is ethology. All right. And 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 that's all part of our main triangles there is they got to understand 
the drives of these dogs. Right? I know I talked about this a bit, but this is number one. If you're going to have a dog, you need a dog. You're choosing dogs for their ability to be aggressive and to fight back and fight harder if someone hits them or kicks them. I've had dog that I donated that had to fight someone who just knocked out a police officer. And when the dog bit this guy, the guy hugged the dog and jumped on top of him and is kicking him and slamming him. And the dog's biting harder, 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 hung in there. So then the officer did not leave, right? He was able to get apprehended. The best dogs, the best dogs are bred to take violence and bring it back, all right? Bring it back. And you should be looking for that in a dog. Now, if that handler, if I would have taught him to, to work with all this frustration and conflict with the dog and then think it's okay to punch the dog and do stuff, the handler would have been toast. The handler would have been destroyed by this dog and then the dog would have been shot or injured or broken teeth. Like this is how it happens, all right? Again, aggression equals aggression. This is basic kindergarten stuff. This is low level information that someone needs to understand about a police dog, all right? If, uh, if a handler succeeds and their dog obeying them out of fear of getting its ass kicked, you are actually not going to have, it's, believe me, because I've seen it, it is going to reflect on the dog's performance. If the dog gets its butt kicked by its own handler to the point of complete submission and cannot win because it knows it's eventually going to lead to getting choked out or something, what do you think is going to happen <laughs> when they're biting a bad guy and the bad guy starts fighting back, especially since a lot of these trainers, they'll hand their dogs over to anyone in their training circles to fix a problem and beat up the dog, right? With no sense of ethology and how the dog works and the relationship and stuff like that, all right? It's not, it's not a common part of the education of, of handlers or training directors. So solution is understand natural is we got to understand natural behavior of the dog. So what I'm going to do is because this is going to go. Um, all right, I'm going to show you some things here because this is remember this stream is available to anyone. And if someone wants to dive into the, the rabbit hole here, this is we could talk about the bite. All right, I'm not just talking smack over here. Okay, the physiology of here's an hour and 30 minutes to understand the dog bites and 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 why the dog bites a certain way. You know, German Shepherds, right? We're using German Shepherds. They were selectively bred and chosen for their ability to grab and hold onto someone, right? Um, watch this stream. Watch this stream because uh, this, this little stream could go on for days. Problem number four. Here goes the problem. Um, organizations. All these organizations, I should have said this. Th this in itself could be extreme. We talk about this. And this is an ethics problem. All these organizations that preach against the proper use of punishment and dog training. I'm going to read that. We'll just talk about it. All right. There's all these organizations that we talked about. American Pet Dog Trainers Association and, and CPT. All, all these ones. Any place where you see where they're, they're vilifying punishment um, and make it some last resort thing, even though... Even though any high level, any, any um, high level material um, is going to state that punishment, we talk about Stephen Lindsay's books, right? The most scientific stuff that's really out there and referenced, not only in theory and in practice shows that it is ridiculous to think that you cannot use punishment as part of a plan and controlling um, these intense dogs, intense situations, not just police dogs, anything. It, Bob Bailey even stated it, who's known for his, of his use of positive reinforcement, all right, and loved by these positive reinforcement communities and purely positive stuff, right? Even he says that punishment is necessary if we're talking about safety, right? Um, about safety and controlling things and, st and, and, and stopping behavior. In no way has he ever said it's that it's abusive, right? And, and 
And in no way does Stephen Lindsay's in these high volumes say anything about punishment being abusive. In practice, nowhere. And in, at nowhere is punishment equal to abuse, all right? Um, and nowhere is training tools equal to abuse, right? Abuse is overuse, misuse, causing injury, all this kind of stuff. What happens is these unethical organizations is they crowd out, they crowd out trainers who are taking the time to learn higher level, more difficulty training. Now, I got to tell you, the best way to learn punishment, all right, these officers need to know how to use punishment the right way. And the best way to learn how to use punishment is to learn how to use positive reinforcement training. Yes, very, very good. If a trainer knows how to maximize, so I'm going to go over here on the notes, all right? Um, if a trainer know, knows how to use positive reinforcement, all right? Here's, here's, a, here's like an, I don't know how long is this. Here's an hour and 30 minutes for you. Anyone wants to dive into the rabbit hole? Here shows a dog that no punishment involved, all right? Um, that you can do bite work, teach the dog to out, all these things using concepts, positive reinforcement, pre-mac principle. The more a trainer understands how to do this, the better they're going to be at punishment because then the punishment is truly used just to kind of nudge the dog back on track. You'll be surprised how little punishment and how effective and how humane it could be if someone knows how to use positive reinforcement. And I am not going to you know, um, try to be fluffy and say that's all you need. There's this video over here. I think it's pretty good. It shows that science can be used to get a, mal a, a dog from police dog lines to do the behaviors. But again, this is in a training room, all right? It's in a training room in a controlled environment, all right? This is a start, but someone should at least understand this before they move to the using punishment sides to things. So that's why I added this one. This is an older video. But again, it's 22 minutes, but it gives an idea how you can um, you can start adding punishment into, into bite work and obedience. Um, basically, this can lead into this. There's no beating up the dog or anything like that. Then here's even a higher level dog. This is just to show I'm not just working with pet dogs, all right? Here goes a dog. This is um, Nate, Nate's dog. This dog comes from Matt comes from known dogs that are n known as very, very strong, dominant, high fight drive working lines that are matter of fact, this dog's own brother and litter mates had to be returned to the breeder because it was eaten up that the handler and no one could handle it. It represents the kind of dog that if someone doesn't know what they were doing would be unusable, meaning it's just too much so intense you can't use it properly but you can see in the video pre-mac principle okay for those of you that are because people are going to watch this video and be like all right he's talking a lot of smack but but is it possible we're showing videos all right this is we'll watch it all right i'm going to I'm going to be aggressive. The handler's not going to be aggressive. This dog is bred. The more you fight it, the harder it's going to fight back. It actually enjoys it. It was selectively bred to like the fight. All right? But... All right, so you don't want to be getting into a fighting contest with this dog if you're the if you're the handler. But what Nate's doing in this video is just simple pre-mac principle. Remember, this is drilled into the dog from when it's younger. The dog does not associate Nate with conflict. The dog actually associates Nate with if he responds, he gets more of what he wants, which is more fight. And this is very easy to do, even in a training situation, and maintain it on the street 
If you just understand simple reward schedules on top of that, and you make a training plan that makes sense on paper, we have a dense enough reward schedule where the dog thinks majority of the time when it responds to the owner, the handler, the handler is on the same team as the dog. It's not an adversary. It's going to get more of what it wants. It's going to get more of what it wants. Um, and now you have a dog that you're not really fighting with. And then when you have to use punishment, it's far less punishment because you're not fighting against all this conflict in the dog. You're helping the dog. Ah! The dog. Start fighting my dog. Uh. Hey, down. 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 Step away. Have you sit? Pop me! Oh! Wow. Oh. 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 Let's see. Ah! 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 Down. Sit. He's coming. Punch. Oh. You. Ah. You. Ah. Ah. Right. Um, ah. Fast forward. <laughs> Have it come. Come. And the dog was even punished there with an e-collar right, um, for not responding. But notice it's not nearly as much um, with the right technology and the right training plan that supports it. Even in this little ghetto setting I had over here, not on a training field, not predictable. We're just mixing it up. The, the dog... The dog responds, right? And these things can be incorporated into uh, the training things. And also, the what you'll notice is um, if you if you train the dog, if you train a dog without conflict and understand the dog's drives, for example, the dog actually likes fight. The dog, when someone's given up and they don't want to fight the dog anymore, instead of that actually becoming a cue to the dog that they're about to get frustrated and get yanked away from something, it becomes a cue to the dog that, or a signal to the dog that, that oh, when someone's not fighting, if I respond to my, to my handler, I'm more likely to make this person fight again, which in real life, yes, the dog would then be able to bite, um, bite the person again. And then it's not so hard in those situations when you get the dog off, if you want to throw the dog another reward, or some officers have those little tugs or something as an extra reward, or to get the dog back into the car. And if you vary your training so that the dog may get another bite sometimes in the training scenarios, even right before the suspect is under control in a car and tries to do an escape, you mix it up and you make it variable. The dog is always ready and prepared for the next fight. And the, the dog ends up associating the giving up of the suspect as potentially um, potentially reason to get another bite. Now, if that handler comes in and is doing this, the handler becomes a fight for the dog and is more likely to trigger that frustration and the fight that the dog has been getting since it was a puppy with a lot of these breeders and stuff like that, okay, um, is... You do not want to, you want to understand the dog, right? You want to, you want to understand the dog and you're going to have um, less of a, much less of a problem. Um, okay. Video's too long, but at least I tried. Um, things, if there's a department, if there's a department that's having, that's having an issue, um, you do not have to, you absolutely do do not have to you, you you can fix the issues it's really not that hard matter of fact with just a paradigm shift and you rethink things um it's not very hard to teach a handler to repair what's going on with their dog and 100 percent eliminate hitting kicking fighting alpha rolls all these things that look bad on camera from from a department um you can get better results. You have to use, if, if understand some basics, which could go into, it does, believe it or not, it's not, when training a handler, it's not that difficult, right? The harder part 
is training someone who is in charge of the training to oversee it to get to a level where they can um, where they can right um, analyze and evaluate and create solutions. That's the harder part. But once you actually have good training systems in place, um, this is what's missing. All right, like for instance. Most professional trainers that are successful and are able to repeat and scale is they're going to have exact things. All right. This is this is just a checklist. But but for each part of training, something as simple as having a dog out on a bite. If you teach the dog using concepts that make sense on paper or scientifically accurate um, is you can actually have quality control and see that it makes sense and see that the dog does it right up to teaching the dog why it's good to do it without any type of punishment at all right to humanely teaching the dog punishment in a minimal amount that you wouldn't be embarrassed to show people um and then get the dog to generalize this into real life you just have to keep a record of it and you have to put and just know that it's possible and just get at it it has to be a paradigm shift it's 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 right there, all right. This um, this reliance on amateur training on a competition field, usually often done by people that have no formal, really no formal training, and not only animal behavior um, or even the science of behavior change that are just mimicking. Um, they're just mimicking techniques or systems that someone else did to achieve the same results on a grass training field, right? Um, you need something that makes sense and is going to make sense to your department. It's going to make sense to the communication. You can use things in the real world that makes things easier, right? Like you can teach the handlers how to actually bond with the dog, praise the dog, love the dog have a better relationship with the dog. It's part of the training and it makes sense on paper why it'll work, um, um, that you'll get better, that you'll get better results. Um, there's a science to everything, all right? Good training involves, we showed you, um, to someone who's completely new to this, a lot of this, uh, probably a head, head is spinning. Anyone that has like some sort of training, you know, some sort of basic understanding of training and wants some tweaking is, it's not that you can incorporate all these things into the into the plan for a handler where they know how to use a variable reward schedule, understand the proper use of pre-MAC schedule, a uh, pre-MAC principle, how to use a continuous punishment schedule, humane. Scientifically, you get the best results over here. There is a science to this where you can get very, very good results that make sense on paper and are usable, and you can actually witness it, and you can tweak it if you have a plan. Um, but we need major changes there. Um, if anyone's watching this, if there are any other, if there's anyone watching who runs a school for police dogs or does anything, steal any information you want. I don't care. All right. I don't care. You don't have to give me credit. Um, it's not about that. All this information in here is public information. Everything about pre-MAC principle, it's not the Bruzo principle. This was someone else's principle. This is built upon the backs of everything that's taught here is not mine. It's just by taking advantage of, of information, all right? Good training should not cost a lot of money. The knowledge, the biggest cost is your time, all right? And the most important information out there, especially to solve this issue, I believe should be free. So I'm going to Put, I'm going to keep putting out as much free stuff as I can to solve this issue because it does not seem to be um, going away anytime soon, right? So I'm going to wrap up this stream because it's been two straight hours. Um, there's no way to squeeze the whole thing into one stream, but hopefully this gives um, anyone who cares about the situation an overview and, and shows my... What, what I hoped to prove during this is yes, there is a problem. There's definitely a problem. Two, there's definitely not a solution embedded on a large scale um, in these police departments or even, even military, as far as I know, where a lot of these police officers, you know, they come out of the military and some of them come into the, come into the civilian world. Three, I'm hoping to at least create some understanding at least to those who have a moderate understanding already of dog training, 
of why some of this stuff is happening. And then four, I'm hoping to at least um, show that there is light at the end of the tunnel by at least showing some examples um, that you can do it. You actually, I've seen it with my own eyes. I have done it, all right? Um, you can 100% have quality police dogs that are very good, um, can perform their duties without needing the animal um, and their handler end up on the news having a war with each other. It does not have to happen. There's no excuse for it. The information is out there. You just got to come and take it. All right. So I'll see. I'll be back on Wednesday for everyone over here. I see there's all kinds of chitter chatter and I mostly ignored you guys in the chat. I'm sorry because I didn't think I was going to get um, get through it. Um, but I'm going to go to everyone's stuff as soon as I stop the, stop the stream here. Okay. Remember, um, police police dog dot training if you want to link directly to the notes and i'll probably update the notes as time goes on over here